Hello, traders, and thank you so much for tuning in. My name is Jason Kretzky, and we are joined today by our friend David Gibbs from CME Group. Recently, we partnered with CME Group to bring live futures data to the TrendSpider platform, and Mr. Gibbs is here with us today to talk to us about all things futures related. So, David, thank you so much for being here, and take it away. Thank you, Jason. Delighted to be here. Um, as mentioned, my name is David Gibbs. I'm on the education team at CME Group, and we're delighted to be sharing a little bit about our markets, our products, and our industry with our friends at TrendSpider. So let's begin with a little bit of background on what CME is, who we are, where we come from, and what we do. Everything uh, that we do at CME involves this word, risk. It's a little word. It's only four letters long in English, but it's a big deal. And it's a big deal. And it's a different, uh, it appears differently in every industry and in every business. Every business has inherent risk. And the function, one of the functions of CME's marketplace is to help market practitioners that already have existing business risk come to a venue to be able to manage or lay off some of that risk. And we've got a long history of doing this covering a lot of different industries and multiple asset classes. So our function as an exchange and the clearinghouse, which are the two big businesses at CME Group, is to provide basically a toolbox of risk management tools to different businesses and different industries around the world. Our two main leading products are standardized futures and options on futures. And as traders, you're going to be familiar with those terms. But we want to talk a little bit about those marketplaces. And for those businesses that come to us with risk that want to lay off or manage that risk, we have a, a, an expression or a term that defines them. These are what we call hedgers. People that come to CME markets that want to sell their risk or lay off their risk are traditionally referred to as people that are hedging risk or hedgers. And in order for them to be able to sell their risk, somebody want, has to be willing to buy it. Now, in many cases, the person buying that offsetting risk is another hedger. It might be somebody with an equal but opposing risk, opposite risk position. But sometimes it takes an additional market participant known as a speculator. A speculator in our business is simply somebody who brings capital to our markets with the anticipation of buying risk, expecting to make a profit from it. And while that name might conjure up negative images in your mind, you know, a snidely whiplash or somebody who's trying to pick off widows and orphans. The speculators in our world are in a regulated marketplace are generally providing a very realistic and important economic function, which is to buy the risk that others want to sell. So we create in our marketplace this balance between speculators and hedgers that results in what we call liquidity. And all liquidity is, is a lot of different participants competing for price, putting up bids, putting up offers. And the more participants that you have competing for that price, the deeper these pools of liquidity. And when you've got deep pools of liquidity, it becomes more efficient for the sellers of that risk to find a buyer of that risk and to make that transference more efficiently from a capital standpoint and a price standpoint. And that's really our main function is price discovery and risk transfer. And we're not the only exchange operator in the world. The futures business is huge and it's global. And what you're looking at uh, on this slide is a chart that's been produced by uh, an organization called the World Federation of Exchanges. And they put out a survey uh, every year of member firms of which uh, CME Group is a member exchange. We provide them with our trading data and they uh, collated and put out this report. There's about 50 reporting futures exchanges around the world. But what you're seeing is the increase in futures trading, uh, most dramatically in the last two years. And it's irrespective of region. Uh, the dark blue line shows you trading from the Americas, the pink line uh, from the Asian Pacific region, and the green line from the, uh, European and, and Northern Africa. Uh, all three of them upwardly sloped, uh, very dramatic increases in the last two years. And this stands to reason because there's been an increase in volatility and in, in market activity around the world in the last two years. This is also from the World Federation Exchanges, and it shows you the pink uh, 
upper part of those columns is the percentage of the total contracts that are traded in futures contracts. The blue part of the column on the bottom half is the percentage of derivative products that are options related. And the reason I wanted to, to show you this uh, slide was that you can see that there's been an increasing amount of options on futures trading. Uh, this is certainly true at CME Group and our uh, in our marketplace, but it's a global phenomenon. As more people get more comfortable with options theory and how options have this wonderful asymmetric risk reward relationship, uh, options trading is becoming much more uh, of a bigger part of our total business. So, at CME Group and our legacy exchanges, we like to think that we make a significant contribution to the real economies because of this idea of a transparent and efficient price discovery mechanism through our central limit order book, our Globex electronic marketplace. And this provides the mechanism for businesses that have risk that would like to sell it or hedge it, meet those who are willing to buy it or assume that market risk. And then after a transaction, it goes into what's known as central clearing through CME clearing. And that central clearing function and the functions of the clearinghouse for post-trade risk management have been recognized by regulators worldwide as the most effective and efficient way to manage open risk. And this is through functions that we've been doing historically in terms of marking to market daily and then demanding or requiring what we call performance bond or margins to support open risk positions. So in the course of our history, CME Group, which was formed in 2007 with the combination of the Chicago Board of Trade and the Chicago Mercantile Exchange to form CME Group, and then they subsequently purchased the New York Mercantile Exchange, who had previously acquired the COMEX Exchange, we now have these four legacy exchanges under one clearing facility. And through those mergers, acquisitions, and product and, and development that we've done since then, we basically have six asset classes of standardized futures and options products. And they cover asset groups from agriculture, foreign exchange, industrial commodities, metals, interest rates, and equity index products. Uh, we even have some specialized products like real estate futures, cryptocurrency futures, and things like uh, uh, weather futures. It just whatever there's a risk, uh, that we think we can create a futures contract around and there's a wide variety of people that might use it, we, we, we put it out there and see how things happen. Ultimately, the market decides which of our contracts are successful and which ones don't particularly do well. So let's get down to the technical aspects of what is a futures contract. And it might be better to start with what it is not. Futures contracts by themselves do not represent or are not considered assets. So when you're long a corn futures contract, you don't own anything. It's simply a price point in time. It conveys no rights of ownership. And in things like uh, treasury futures, they don't accrue interest. If you're long an S&P 500 futures contract, you're not participating in dividend income, for example. Those would be rights and benefits that accrue to actual asset owners. What a futures contract is, is what it says it is. It's a legally binding contract between buyer and seller that uh, provides certain rights, but also certain obligations. And each one of our standardized futures contracts has those outlined in what we call the contract specifications, which you can read on our website. Now, because a futures contract is not an asset, it doesn't require its full notional value at the point of purchase or sale. It simply requires what we call performance bond. And this is referred to in futures industry as a margin. And that's not to be confused if you're, if you're familiar with stock trading and buying stocks on margin, it's not the same thing. Stock margin refers to being able to borrow the capital to buy the stock. And in the US, that's usually covered by Reg T, allows you to, if you're qualified, to borrow up to 50% of that asset from a broker, buy the stock, and you, you carry the stock on your book, but you're also paying a loan on the broker loan to cover the other 50%. In the futures business, margin refers to that amount that the clearinghouse determines is required to continue to hold that open position. 
And it's generally a, a fraction of the notional amount somewhere, depending on the contract, between uh, traditionally between like five and 15 percent. Now, some products like cryptocurrencies require a much higher margin because they're deemed by clearing to have a higher level of risk. So always consult your broker uh, about margins on futures. There's two types of margins uh, that you're going to learn about if you get involved in the futures market. One is the initial margin, and that has to be in place with your broker prior to execution of a trade. That's to cover the open position from the time it's put on. Uh, as the market fluctuates and your position from a profit and loss perspective goes up and down, if it goes down enough to hit what's known as the maintenance margin level, you're going to be re required to put more capital up, more cash or securities up to secure that open position back up to the initial margin level. So margins can fluctuate with market volatility, but your position in your open account will determine how much you have to add or can take out depending on whether the trade is positive or negative. And these are monitored all day and all night by the clearinghouse. And uh, we, we regulate that amount by taking money and crediting money back through the clearing firms that act as agents or intermediaries uh, between CME and the customer account. So what is this futures contract? It's a standardized agreement. In, in other words, you don't privately negotiate uh, the agreement or the terms of your futures contract. They're all the same for everybody. And this is what helps us develop these deep pools of actional liquidity because they're standardized, which means they're interchangeable. You can get into a futures contract and because it's done through the Globex electronic execution platform and intermediated through clearing firms, you're going to be anonymous to whoever takes the other side of your trade. And then likewise, because they're standardized, you can get out of your position at any time and it doesn't require going back to that same counterparty. The contracts are interchangeable. That's what makes them so useful. They're not only easy to get into, but more importantly, they're easy to get out of. As long as the market's got liquidity, which it will, if it's got open interest, you can get in and out of these contracts very, very quickly. Here's an example of an abbreviated contract spec description. Uh, we're looking at the E-mini S&P 500 futures contract, and it's got a Globex ticker symbol, capital E, capital S. Um, the current front month is the December 2022 futures contract, and that is identified by its month. The, the December month is identified by the letter Z. And then the two that you see following that is the last digit of the four digit year. So the full ticker for the December 2022 E-mini futures contract is ESZ2. It's quoted in US dollars and cents per index point. So you'll see a number uh, with a minimum price change increment of 0.25 for the E-mini S&P. Each one of those contracts in this example of uh, 4219.25 per contract, that's the index quoted price, is worth $50. So the notional or financial equivalent value of one E-mini contract at that price would be worth $210,962.50. Now at the time the slide was created, the initial margin on one E-mini futures contract was 11, roughly $11,000. That would be the amount of capital that would have to be in the trading account prior to execution to be able to cover one of those E-mini futures contracts. Now, as the market goes up and down, as the P&L changes, the margin account is going to move and additional funds would be required if the, if the market position dropped in value. And again, margins can be reset at any time according to clearing. So you want to be uh, in contact with your brokerage firm to know when those changes take place. Most of our futures con contracts have these uh, letter and number identifiers, and they're going to be anywhere from three to four characters. Uh, generally, that last digit is, is expressed as a number, refers to the last uh, digit in the calendar year. And then there's going to be a letter representing the expiration month of that contract. And this is the table that shows you what they are. And, the, you know, if you've got any questions about where this comes from, it's an old story that relates to where your fingers fall on a standard keyboard, because at one time, all of the orders had to be hand key punched 
uh, on a teletext machine or into a, a machine that would produce uh, computer cards to be read by the clearinghouse. So the, the letters here represent the months of the year. Futures contracts, because they're basically price points in time, have an expiration date. Every futures contract expires at some point in the future. Uh, and when they reach that expiration date, they're traditionally at CME settled one of two ways, physical settlement or physical delivery or cash settlement or financial settlement. Crude oil futures are an example of a physically settled or a physically delivered contract. At the end of an expiration cycle, the short position would deliver a physical position in crude oil to the long in the form of a warehouse receipt uh, in exchange for payment. Now, before you get excited about physical delivery, understand that it's a fraction of the total open interest that goes to expiration. Most people that are using our markets, even commercial and institutional users, have no interest in going to delivery. The purpose of our markets and the reason they use the markets is because they're already in that business. They're using the futures contracts to lay off that risk. So they can facilitate a delivery because they're in that business, but they generally don't want to. So the vast majority, not over 95% in most contracts of open interest, rolls forward or is offset prior to going to final settlement. So uh, it's important to understand that that physical expiration or physical delivery component is embedded in a lot of our traditional commodity contracts. That's what imposes the pricing integrity on the futures relative to its underlying market. Remember, futures contract is a derivative and it derives its value from something tangible. In the case of crude oil, it's crude oil. In the case of treasury futures, it's treasuries. In the case of an E-mini S&P 500, which is financially settled, it's settling to an index. And at the last trading, any open interest is transferred through a cash payment index value to previous day's settlement. So those two ways that a contract can be settled, physical or financial expiration. One last thing to be aware of that I've, I've mentioned already is this term called open interest. I think most of us understand what average daily trading volume is. It's the number of transactions that take place during a trading day. But open interest is a futures term that refers to a position that's established in one day's trading that isn't offset in that same day, but carries forward to the next day. Any positions that are put on in today's trade, for example, that aren't offset are considered open positions and they will increase the open interest in a futures contract. If I have a trade open coming into today and I offset it, I will be dropping the open interest in a futures contract. So open interest gives traders the ability to see not just what's trading intraday, but how much of that trade is open going into the next day. And from a technical trading standpoint, this is giving you information about the depth of the market and potential futures trades, because there's only, to my knowledge, three ways a futures position can be offset. It can be offset just by putting on the opposite and opposing position. In other words, if I'm long and I sell the same futures contract for the same expiration month, I flatten my position. I no longer have any risk in that contract. I can roll my position forward if I want to maintain exposure to that contract, but realize that expiration is approaching and I don't want the contract to fall off either through physical delivery or financial settlement. I'll roll my position forward by doing what's known as a calendar spread, offsetting the existing position and simultaneously creating a new one in a deferred contract month. And then the final would be if I, if I want to have it expire at expiration, I will engage in the futures contracts final settlement calculation. Now, for many of you that are looking at the futures market, your broker is going to want to know what kind of business you're in and that you're able to accept physical delivery of a contract, or they may require you to either roll forward or offset before the delivery month. So these are details that you're going to want to discuss with your, uh, with your broker. So, Standardized futures and options, that's our main business. Every contract has its own contract specifications and rule book to describe what the product is 
how it works, how it's quoted, when it trades, when the trade terminates, and its final settlement value. And you can find these at cmegroup.com under our markets for every single product that we list. Um, I want to give you one more technical aspect. This is an example from the crude oil market, the WTI crude oil futures, which is symbol, trading symbol is CL. This is from the middle of the summer, and you'll notice crude oil futures prices listed in, in progressive time on the left with each price, the trading volume and the open interest. The same day, if we look at the July crude futures price at 120 and 19 cents, is trading below the spot price for the same day of 120 and 80 cents. That difference between the futures contract and the underlying physical is known as basis, futures basis. It's a, it's a futures term, and the basis refers to the price difference between cash and futures, or physical and futures price. And this is an important uh, thing to be aware of because it's the futures that are deriving their price from the physical market. And that differential between price of futures and price in spot is a, is a result of a formula. And that formula is driven by a lot of different market influences. So futures contracts, depending on the product and the underlying, might trade at a premium or trade at a discount to its underlying product. Now in commodities like agricultural products or industrial products like crude, natural gas, and others, um, these are defined by premium and discount. Uh, if a futures contract trades in its deferred month at a premium to spot, it's said to be in Cantango. If it's trading at a discount to its spot price, it's said to be in backwardation. These are commodity trading terms that you might hear as you investigate more about the futures markets. We also have basis in financial products, but we usually refer to them as positive and negative carry. Uh, and that's also driven by economic forces. Negative carry resulting in contracts over time trading at a premium to spot. And if it's trading at a discount, it's generally because of what's known as positive carry. And an example in the E-mini S&P would be two years ago when we were at zero interest rate policy. Uh, the lower financing cost of funds meant the futures contract traded at a discount. But recently, in the last six months, as the Fed has been raising short-term interest rates in response to inflation, that contract valuation has flipped and is now trading at a premium to spot uh, as a result of higher funding costs and negative carry. We also have futures contracts at different notional sizes. So when we looked at, for example, the E-mini S&P that had roughly a financial equivalent of $200,000, we also offer micro treasury, uh, my, excuse me, micro E-mini futures that trade at a tenth of that size, or roughly $20,000 a contract. Many of our products offer multiple size contracts to fit the end user's usefulness. Big contracts tend to be, or standard contracts tend to be used by institutional and commercial users, but also some individuals. The micros, small enough for individual investors to find uh, on benchmark products as well. So if you go to cmegroup.com, you can see the, the whole list by product class of the different sized standardized futures contracts. Other things to be aware of that are in those contract specifications that you want to be mindful of are trading hours, trading limits, uh, position limits if you're an institutional or commercial user, um, things like delivery grade and, and quantity and things of that nature, if, again, if you're a commercial or an institutional user, but all of those things outlined in the contract specifications on the website. We also, on most of our benchmark and leading futures contracts, offer options on those futures contracts, but be mindful that at CME, when we talk about options, the options are the second derivative. The futures contract derives its value from its underlying product or index. The options at CME derive their pricing from the futures contract. So our options at CME will be options on futures. The underlying vehicle on which they're extracting or deriving their prices and premiums are derived from the price of the futures contract, which is itself a derivative of another market. So be aware of that. They're very, very liquid. Options are a very, very useful product. Um, and that could be a subject for another conversation. But uh, our leading products have very deep and active 
options markets as well. Jason, that concludes my, my formal remarks. I'm happy to take any of your questions that you might have regarding anything about CME Group and how we might be able to help you. David, that was an awesome presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, a curious question that I have for you is for somebody who is coming from specifically trading stocks, uh, maybe trading uh, options contracts on stocks, what would be the benefits uh, for somebody who's just used to the stock world coming over into futures and trading futures? Well, the first thing is, is there's a wider variety of, of asset classes. Stock trading, obviously, is part of the equity market. Uh, but at CME, you've got access to commodity markets, both agricultural as well as industrial, also metals, both base and precious, foreign currency markets, uh, as well as interest rates. Um, in addition to uh, the, the stock index futures market contracts that we have. So it would be both complementary to a stock trader, but also additive in that you've now got access to a wider variety of, of products based on different industry activities. Got it. I guess my only other question for you then is, you know, for somebody who's completely new to futures, where is the best place for them to go outside of this video and the awesome presentation you just gave? Um, where's the best place for them to go to learn everything that they need to know to feel comfortable getting into trading futures? Well, I'm going to do, do a little shameless self-promotion since you teed that up so beautifully. Uh, I'm going to send the, the listeners to cmegroup.com. And if you go to our website at the top, across the top rail, there's a, 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 a menu bar that includes education. And if you click on that education tab, it can take you to what we call CME Institute. And at CME Institute, we have an enormous amount of resources that are free for the viewer to use that include things like courses on how our marketplace works, the various products and how they perform. Uh, there are archived webinars with market experts and historical white papers on various trading strategies and so forth. A plethora of things for the viewer to take advantage of at their own time and at the privacy of their own computer so they can learn at their own speed. Um, and then you can track our markets uh, the same way, either by, by, by going to the different marketplaces themselves and looking at prices, or we even have a function if you sign in and register to create what's called My Portfolio and can begin to track futures prices with your own created, uh, uh, be able to record the things you want to watch yourself instead of having to hunt and pick and find them every single day. So uh, short answer, go to cmegroup.com and access the education tab. There's an enormous amount of resources there for you to use specifically to learn more about the industry and the marketplace. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, David, for joining us. Uh, we here at Transpetter are so excited to be partnered up with CME Group uh, to bring futures data to all of our users. So thank you again. Good luck and thanks for joining.